very much. Pleasure to be uh, here in my uh, old college. I always kind of duck as I come in in case those library books 20 years ago are still sought, or that essay from 23 years ago, 22 years ago, 21 years ago are also still sought. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about campaigning for secularism. I do so uh, from a modest position because the first uh, the first rule of campaigning is to when you're campaigning in Parliament is to hold your seat. And I failed to do that. But that's given me a bit of time to, to think about what I want to do in the next few years at least. Uh, and uh, the last year has been spent working towards uh, something to do with evidence-based policy campaigning, which has come to fruition. Uh, but this is also an important part of my future plans. And what I want to do is set out for you today what I think the um, secular community, and I'll define that a little, I'll try and I'll explore the definitions of that, that's not overclaimed here, uh, a little, about what, what the secular community should be doing to convert what we think, uh, what we want, what we rail against, into policy. Okay? Um, uh, whatever the political situation nationally and locally, it's very important to be very clear about what your policy aims are, because that will inform how you then go about seeking to do that. So what I'm going to do is set out what I think some of the aims should be, I think Naomi's going to then talk about some of the things that the BHA is already doing in these areas. What I want to do, and I've, got, I've spent, as I say, several months thinking about uh, the way we can implement some of these, and we can talk about how we implement some of those in discussion, and I'll mention a few of the things. But what I also want you to do, if you can, in the discussion that follows uh, Naomi's talk, is to let me know if you disagree with anything in here, or if anything is missing. Uh, I hope I'll be persuasive enough to show that there is a, uh, a, 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 there can be a settled view of what we want when we talk about a secular society, uh, and, it's, and it's in here. Uh, and this is taken broadly from a, an article I wrote for, for The Guardian some time ago, which I've been working on since. So I just want to talk about what secularism isn't, uh, and it doesn't mean that I don't think we should be any of these things, or shouldn't be any of these things, it's just in policy terms, if we're serious about wanting state neutrality, we need to be clear that we're in, we aren't uh, a belief campaign, it's, uh, it's a cross-belief campaign, and excuse the spelling. So <laughs> what secularism is not, and uh, then blame that on the train on the way here, uh, it's not about atheism, agnosticism, or humanism, uh, and it's not restricted to the non-religious. If we're going to get any of this policy change, we're going to have to uh, in, uh, encompass people who are religious, but who also believe in what I will go on to describe as a neutral state. And certainly in my own political party, we were only able to get the policy objectives agreed as part of our policy by having broad support for many of them from uh, the religious, uh, some of the religious in the party. Um, it's certainly not aggressive or militant, uh, and therefore uh, we, sh we should rightly object, and I always do object, to uh, broadcasters and newspapers editorialising, talking about aggressive uh, uh, secularism or militant secularism. Um, obviously our opponents will do that, but we should expect better things of people who are supposed to be more neutral. And it's not about seeking to remove religious views from the public square. We couldn't square it. We, could, we shouldn't. And we couldn't even if we wanted to. Or even religion from existing <coughs> in the public square. It's a subtle point which we can explore. Because uh, that's often the, pro the complaint of our opponents, that, that, that secularism and seeking a neutral state wants to abolish the religious voice for public debate. What would a secular manifesto seek? Broadly, these things, the maximisation of freedom of religious belief and religious free speech. So we should really, there should be no controls or bars on what people are allowed to believe. There's an issue about at what point, about how that's done within households and families. Um, but nevertheless, society should say you have maximum freedom of belief and indeed as much freedom of speech for the religious or non-religious belief systems as possible. But the freedom to manifest religious belief uh, must be within the limits of the need to protect the rights and freedoms of others. And that's the key battleground in many of the areas that you'll, you'll see. And you'll see that those words come from Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which in 9.1 talks about 
the freedom of belief, uh, which is unqualified, and then in 9.2, the qualified freedom to manifest that belief, which is uh, qualified by issues of national security, uh, public health, and the rights and freedoms of others. And so when you hear the religious talking about their Article 9 rights to manifest a religious belief by discrimination, they omit the Article 9.2 rights, referring to Article 14 rights of people not to be discriminated against uh, 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 on the grounds of their religion or sexual orientation. Um, we need to end religious privilege, state arranged religious privilege, um, and separate church and state, which, which is a precondition of doing all of those things. It's very hard to have a, a, a non-separate church and state which doesn't have by definition almost religious privilege and which doesn't have the right freedom of belief for the non-chosen religion of the state and get, getting the balance right on those other things. So we have this problem about the definition of secularism <coughs> because people often feel, well, how are we define it? Uh, when we get, when we talk about turning our beliefs and what we want to see into effective political campaigning, we've got to recognise the way that people see language. So if we want to create a political movement, we have to do, do, uh, do it without ambiguity or confusing terms. And so I'm looking for a way of, of trying to identify uh, terms that will encompass those religious people who also believe in no religious privilege and, and neutral state and separation of church and state and the maximisation of religious belief while protecting the rights and freedoms of others. And so I'm looking at a uh, campaign for public religious neutrality, which sounds long-winded, and probably is, and I would be interested to know if you have any thoughts about how we might go, because the problem is that if you talk about secularism or secularity, people think you're anti-religion, and uh, we all have our views on religion, um, but in terms of public policy, uh, that's not going to work, uh, I, I suggest, <coughs> discuss. So these are some of the, I've got ten, ten here, because uh, it matched the Ten Commandments mainly. Uh, it doesn't, so there may be some missing, there may be some that are slightly duplicative, and this is really a first draft, which I'm going to publish more formally on the internet for consultation shortly, but, um, but I'd like to talk you through it. Um, so firstly, and I feel this very strongly, because I, I do feel strongly about free expression, and this is something where we have common cause with the religious, we want to have a free religious expression, uh, limited only by obvious objective requirements, not to incite violence or other crimes, uh, and not uh, to publicly and directly cause someone to strike <coughs> harm. So to berate someone publicly in the street, which is kind of a, a section a section four public order offence, is quite rightly speaking a public order offence. But to say something in a speech uh, like a free speech demonstration at Trafalgar, uh, Trafalgar Square and have someone on the other side of the square passing by saying they've been offended by it uh, because of its content uh, should not be a criminal offence and uh, I have a separate campaign seeking to uh, change the law to get rid of uh, uh, Section 5 from the Public Order Act. So the sorts of things that we secularists have a proud record on, I believe, in this country uh, is uh, leading the fight against overbroad incitement to religious hatred laws, including the defeat of the last government, one of the very few defeats that it had. Um, abolition of the English blasphemy laws, which again was led by uh, secularists. Um, seeking to abolish, as I've said, broad public order offences uh, of the type I've mentioned. And there's a whole, I, I wrote a paper for government special advisors in the last couple of months on that, and it, it ended up being 30 pages. Um, uh, so it's full of examples of the sort of nonsense that, that uh, the police get involved with. Opposing a defamation of religion law at the UN, which is an ever-present threat and an ever-present battle for uh, humanists and secularists and liberal democracies internationally. Opposing burger bans, except in the circumstances where it's required for the proper performance of public functions and the proper performance, the proper respect for health and safety. Um, and I, I'd be happy to discuss that, but it doesn't make sense to me to criminalise women who wear burqas because either they are the victims of being forced to, so criminalising them is wrong, 
but they're choosing to themselves, in which case they're not victims and criminalising them is wrong. And so I think our colleagues in France have, uh, and others have got that wrong. And again, secularists are generally at the forefront against religious minded people of saying that isn't the way to deal with the oppression of women in some religions, these sort of simplistic bans. Uh, supporting the rights of Muslims to build mosques subject to normal planning rules is again something that we secularists should be leading on uh, because that should be seen very clearly as religious discrimination from other religions as we had in Oxford recently. <coughs> Uh, it was religious complaining about uh, uh, the uh, a mosque being built in, in Oxford. Um, ending discrimination against non-religious beliefs. Uh, again, there are three examples there. Religious broadcasting slots, uh, committees that draw up the syllabus for religious studies. These are called sacres, which don't by rights have to have a, a humanist on, which is entirely wrong. It's interesting that when humans do get involved, as many leading members of the uh, or staff of the British Humanist Association uh, and, their, and their colleagues are on, they end up being chairs of them because they, it just shows how competent they are, I suppose. But nevertheless, there is a problem, there's a whole problem about the religious syllabus. But it doesn't help that some non religious beliefs are excluded from that slot. And then bodies that advise the government on matters relating to religion. There's an open door already. Uh, for religious interests that don't, doesn't exist for non-religious interests and there are some bodies that exist purely and by definition to give advice on religion and not other, <coughs> not other belief systems, nor there should be people advising them on how to ensure neutrality. That's really what they should be uh, doing if they're going to be sensible. Um, this is a big deal for me, uh, this one, and is one of the most controversial ones because there's huge vested interests at stake here. But stopping faith schools from sacking or rejecting a teacher based on his or her religious or marital status. Um, and <coughs> it is uh, remarkable, worthy of remark and astonishing that uh, the Equality uh, Act excludes uh, the School Stance and Framework Act from its remit because even the last government's equality laws, which were not particularly good, in the area of having overbroad religious exemption, <coughs> recognised that the, what faith schools are allowed to do is way beyond anything that's allowed by the equality law we have. And obviously, because our equality law is dictated by European directives, um, actually, if we could just find some cases of people who will uh, uh, take a legal case against a faith school, we are automatically going to win that. It's just a sense of frustration I have that in the uh, years I've been involved, we haven't organised for a uh, non-religious teacher who's nearing retirement to apply for a job at the faith school, to get a letter saying, no, you don't qualify, to take it to court and we would win. That would change the law. Let's do it. Uh, and that's uh, without, without fishing for cases, of course, which is apparently not allowed. Um, so, uh, Preventing state-funded faith schools from discriminating against and segregating children on religious grounds, 